This is VLSI data conversion circuits lecture 14. Uh, Let us quickly uh, recap what we did the last time uh, and wind up our discussion on uh, the various windows that are commonly used in data converter work. So, if this represents the spectrum of the input sine wave that you want to decipher from its samples, uh, we are looking at a finite record which can be thought of as an infinite record multiplied by a finite length window. So, if you have a cosine and it runs all the way from minus infinity to infinity, this is the Fourier transform, discrete time Fourier transform of uh, the cosinusoid. We are interested in looking at it only over a window. The very first case we thought about was the so called rectangular window where all samples are weighted with equal importance. Uh, then we said that there is uh, trouble with that and we would like to weight the samples in the end you know, less than the samples in the middle. So, we multiplied the, uh, the infinite record not with a rectangular window, but a window with a specific shape. Right? One, was, one example was uh, the raised cosine type window called the uh, the hand window and the other one was uh, the Blackman Harris window. And what we said was when you multiply the sinusoid with a window, then in the Fourier domain it is convolution of the two, uh, two Fourier transforms. Uh, this denotes the Fourier transform of the window function. Right? This is just a representative shape. Uh, depending on the exact nature of the window you choose, this shape will keep changing. So, after convolution, what you end up with is a spectrum of this shape. This is nothing but the window spectrum convolved with that of the cosinusoid, which was just two impulses. Please bear in mind that this represents the Fourier transform of this now finite length sequence. When you compute the FFT, what you are doing is you are sampling the spectrum at, at uh, you know multiples of 2 pi by m right or n where n is a number of record uh, points in the record right. Which means that you are basically ending up with these samples right whose envelope will kind of look like this right. So, after the FFT this is what you will see, you will only see these samples. So, as you can see the choice of the window is very important in determining how much the input tone spreads in frequency right and depending on the choice of the window you will be able to say I mean different windows have will behave differently with respect to spreading of the input. And uh, so, it is instructive to plot the discrete time Fourier transform of some popular windows. The one in red is that of the rectangular window, as you can see, the main lobe width is quite small. Right. Unfortunately, it does not it does not roll off very quickly okay. which uh, uh, gels well with our uh, experience that when we used a rectangular window and if the input tone was not lying on a bin, then you are not basically sampling the nulls of the Fourier transform right? and you end up with a tail which is not dying down very rapidly. Uh, an improvement was the the hand window and you can see that it is better than the rectangular window all right it turns out that the rectangular window as we discussed a couple of classes back falls off in frequency only as as 1 over omega 
because it is of the form sin something by something correct it is a sig function which goes off rolls off as 1 over omega and that makes sense because the window function has got discontinuities at its edges. If there is a discontinuity the spectrum will fall off as 1 by omega if there is a discontinuity in the derivative it will fall off as 1 by omega square and if the you know higher order derivatives are all going to 0 the the uh, rate at which it falls off will be much higher than you know uh, omega square correct. The, uh, the Blackman Harris window is depicted here and you can see that definitely the main lobe is much wider okay but the side lobe strength is now much smaller than what you have with the rectangular or the hand windows okay now this has some practical implementation uh, implications when uh, we talk about data converter work. Uh, before we get there, I just want to again remind you the context in which uh, we were talking about the choice of which window to use, right. Please recall that if we were dealing with a Nyquist rate converter where the quantization noise as it turns out is mostly flat with frequency, then the if the input is lying on a bin then there is no need for you know any exotic window simply using a rectangular window is good enough because the input is lying on a bin and uh, even if there is discontinuity in the noise uh, between the beginning and end of the record you will not be able to distinguish it that will not cause enough leakage to cause the, the noise uh, spectral shape or the values to change appreciable. Hmm? On the other hand as we will see going forward there are families of data converters where the output of the converter the sequence is signal plus noise, but this noise is not flat with frequency it is high pass filter right. In other words at low frequency that is here the power of the noise is actually very very small. Under these circumstances as we saw last time if the uh, there are discontinuities in the noise at the end of the record then that small discontinuity is enough to cause spectral leakage which will mask the true SNR that the converter is actually producing right. And, uh, as we discussed the last time around this represents what you would get with a rectangular window while this represents what you would get when you take the sequence the input mind you still lies on a bin right and to emphasize that I have shown this in blue right when you just compute the FFT of the input there is no problem at all correct. The problem is occurring because of the noise leaking okay because of discontinuities at the edges. So, this represents what you would get with a hand window and as you can see we are doing much better with the hand window than we are with the rectangular window. And this is again I will emphasize even if the input is sitting on on a bin that means that the input source and the clock sources are synchronized all right. Now going forward if I used a Blackman Harris window instead of a hand window and the input lies on a bin. So, input is on an FFT bin
okay and i use a blackman harris window instead okay please recall that with a hand window there are only if the input lies on a bin then the input will leak to exactly a total of 3 bins the bin on which the input lies and two neighboring bins and all others will be zero that's not the case with a blackman harris window so which is why you are seeing this part okay so this represents the red curve here is the hand window while the blue curve is the blackman harris window okay all right however notice that this level of leakage is roughly about this skirt is about 150 db down not perhaps 150 but it's a reasonable approximation so usually for most of the resolutions that are measured in practice this is not a this is not a problem right so if you put the thing on the bin uh, the blackman harris seems to be doing slightly worse than the than the hand window now what is important is what happens when for some strange reason let us say we are not able to synchronize the input source and the clock in other words the input now no longer is not sitting on an fft bin and clearly as you can see which do you think is the hand window please note that the hand window has a has a smaller main lobe so this is the hand window however it does not fall off quite as rapidly as the blackman harris window and this makes sense when you look at the we saw this shapes of the fourier transforms of the window functions and this makes sense we saw that the blackman harris window uh, fourier transform falls off much more rapidly than the the hand window the fourier transform of the hand window this is clear so now we have seen the properties of various windows so let's discuss where you would want to use which one right so when the signal is sitting on a bin which is the better window to use pardon yes so signal is on an fft bin and what scenarios do you think it is possible to put the signal on an fft bin and what practical scenarios do you think it's possible to do this
So one uh, you know possibility is when you are running simulations on circuits, right? You have the freedom to choose whatever input frequency you want, and by definition, on a computer, right? If you say sine omega t and you know sine omega n t and sine omega s t or sine two pi f n t and sine two pi f s t, if f n by f s is chosen properly, they will be in sync, correct? So during simulation or if it is so possible that during measurement if it is possible to sync the clock source with the input then also you can force this input tone being on an FFT bit right. Under both these circumstances you will want to use the hand wind. With regard to uh, simulation it is especially important to note that one of the big advantages of the hand window is that it only occupies the main lobe if the input is sitting on a bin is only three, 3 bins wide right because if you run if you want a long record length right okay I mean the advantage of having only 3 bin wide main lobe is that in the desired signal band which is only at low frequencies okay the number of bins are limited obviously the record length is covers the entire range from 0 to fs by 2 right but we are only interested in a part of that frequency range which means that the number of frequency bins in the desired frequency range is small now out of those bins if you within quotes waste a lot of bins spreading the input sine wave around then the number of bins left to which I mean from which to estimate the noise properly is, is small correct. So from that point of view it makes sense to choose a window where the main lobe is as small as possible right. Obviously the rectangular window does not work its main lobe is only is the smallest you can get but we saw that there is a big problem with leakage a very good choice is the is the hand window. And uh, this means that if you are only prepared to lose you know 3 bins in the signal band to the signal to the input signal then you have a few more bins to estimate the noise properly from right or given that you want so many bins to estimate noise properly it means that you can run you can have a record length which is much smaller in the case of a hand window than you would need when you had a, a window which had a wider main lobe for example the Blackman Harris is that clear right. So and in simulation if you want a longer record length it means that you have to wait for a much longer time because a computer takes you know so much longer to compute a data which is good enough for a larger length FFT. Is this clear? On the other hand, if you are not able to sync the source with the sampling clock, and when does this occur? During measurement, one very often comes up comes across a situation where it is not possible to sync the input source with the clock source in which case the input is definitely not sitting on an FFT bin correct which means that using a hand window is not a good idea because there will be a lot of leakage. So here what would you want to use you would want to use a Blackman Harris window the fact that a Blackman Harris window has a wide main lobe is not really a concern anymore and why do you think that is not a concern? Yeah there are 9 bins so we said that is a problem uh, in the earlier case right if you, if you if you spread the input signal over 9 bins then obviously the number of bins that you have to estimate noise from has reduced is not it. So 
how many I mean uh, so I mean how is that not anymore a problem when you are doing measurements. Yeah, so, the uh, during measurement the constraints are very different right. So, it is very easy to capture 10 times more data it is just you know more memory ok. So, you are capturing digital data right a longer record length simply means that you have to capture a longer stream. So, instead of taking 1 second it will take 10 seconds to capture 10 times more data right, but that is not a problem at all ok which means that it does not matter if the main lobe is you know you lose 9 bins to to the main input tone you collect let us say you know 4 times more data you have a record length which is 4 times more which means that you have a lot more bins in the desired signal band right which means that whether you know the main uh, whether the input signal is spread over 3 bins or 9 bins does not really matter because you have so many other bits. Is this clear? Okay. So, this is uh, something that is useful to bear in mind. So, during simulations you will almost always use a hand window whereas, while making measurements you know you can use any other window which also has a smaller side lobe level right a good window to use is the Blackman Harris window ok. And uh, this you will be specifically using when we talk about oversampled converters where it turns out that the output spectrum of the, uh, the A to D con uh, converter consists of the input signal plus noise which is looks as if it is high pass filter and we are interested in only noise in, in the low frequency bands ok. All right. So, this uh, uh, kind of concludes my uh, uh, my concludes whatever I had to say on uh, FFTs and windowing and when you would do what ok. So, now let us move on to the next part which is So, in other words you have sampled, we know how to build circuits which sample and input onto a capacitor right. Uh, I am assuming all of you are taking analog IC design simultaneously or have taken it before which means that once you have a capacitors charged to some voltage that we want using operational amplifiers we can figure out ways in which it can drive other circuitry without disturbing the voltage on the charge on these capacitors. So, uh, a little further down in this course hopefully, uh, your uh, I mean you will have done a lot more uh, circuit design in analog IC design and then we will put the op amps together with the capacitors uh, which have already sampled the input. Okay, but for the time being let us assume that we know once we have captured the input on a capacitor, we know how to make it drive you know other circuitry without disturbing the charge which has been held on this capacitor right. Okay. So, now let us look at uh, quantization at uh, a very abstract level. Uh, So, you have an input as we discussed before which has been sampled and held on a capacitor. Now, we want to figure out in which of these bins I mean which of these ranges the input lies in. Right? So, the input is assumed to occupy a range say 0 to Vref right which is called the full scale of the ADC. Please note that the ADC is nothing but 
analog to digital converter consists of both the sampling system. Once you have sampled, we need to quantize. So, all we are trying to do now is figure out the sampled value lies between in this particular example, we want to divide up the input into 8 equal ranges right? and the width so to speak of each range is V ref by 8 and this is also called the step size. Okay. So, if the input lies between say 0 and V ref by 8, we arbitrarily assign to it a digital code. So, this mind you is a is a code which can be represented by yeah how many this can be represented by a 3 bit digital word. Okay, ranging all the way from say 0, 0, 0 to 1, 1, 1. So, the input lies within this range you get 0 when the input lies between uh, 2 V ref by 8 and V ref by 8 you get 1 and so on. Right? So, uh, so, this is what we want to do. This is what is called an ideal quantizer. In this case, this is a 3 bit quantizer, okay, which divides the input into 8 equal ranges and figures out in which of these ranges the input lies. Obviously, when you want an ideal characteristic like this in practice, what you get is probably anywhere, I mean nowhere close to what you want. Let us now figure out what all errors can happen. Okay. The first thing is that perhaps you are lucky enough that this staircase right, is just shifted either towards the left or towards the right. I mean, that is the most benign kind of thing that you can expect to happen. And so, this thing here represents the ideal transfer curve whereas the black picture shows the actual transfer curve right both of them are staircases of the same kind is just that one is offset from the other and quite logically it seems to call I mean this kind of error is called offset. All right. And as we discussed before in many cases offset error is not really a concern because it can be corrected digitally somewhere else in the in the system you understand. Okay. One more aspect that I would like to point out is that if the input exceeds a certain amount, the output code will either be 0 or will saturate at 7. I mean the input is, is here somewhere, clearly the output gets is not going to exceed, the output code is not, is going, is not going to exceed. 7. In the same fashion, if the input is way below 0, the input code is not going to exceed or not going to go below 0. And uh, so, within quotes, the useful range of the quantizer is, is this place where this staircase, if you look at it from far away, has got a slope of 1. Okay. So, if the input lies in this range, then the quantizer is you know operating properly. If on the other hand, if the input is is within these ranges where the output of the quantizer is saturated, 
this is a, there is a term for this, this is called overloading the quantizer, which is just a fashionable way of saying the quantizer is saturated. And sometimes it is not uncommon to refer to this range, the normal range of operation as the no overload All right. The next kind of error is that, okay, well, maybe there is no offset, but maybe all the steps instead of being V ref by 8 are the ideal staircase, mind you, has got equal step sizes, all the step sizes being equal to in this particular example V ref by 8. Now, one kind of error is that the step sizes may all be equal, maybe there is no offset, but the step sizes may not be equal to V ref by 8. Okay, maybe there is they are V ref by 8.5 or V ref by 7.5, something like that. You understand? And uh, how do you think the, uh, the characteristic will look then? No? The number of levels will remain the same. Pardon? If the step size, if each of these step sizes becomes, each of these step widths becomes more, what do you think will happen? How will the staircase look? I mean, if the step becomes more, the slope of the staircase becomes, if the step size becomes more. It becomes the slope changes, it becomes smaller than what it was earlier, okay. And uh, not surprisingly, this is what is called a gain error, right. Slope is uh, often related, I mean, is basically the change in digital code due to a change in the analog input voltage, right. On the average, I mean, it is very, very difficult to talk about a slope of a staircase because the slope is either 0 or infin infinity, but what when I say the slope has changed it basically means if you kind of draw a straight line which fits the staircase, the slope of that straight line is, is changed. Is this clear? So, this is an example of an error, this is the ideal staircase. And here is a case where the step size is uniform, however, that uniform step size is not the original intended step size of V ref by 8. And as you can see, please note that there are no missing codes, all the codes exist, it is just that you now have to excite the input a little more in order to get the the same code in this particular example. You can also have a situation where the steps are, are smaller, in which case the slope will be larger, right. And this is what is called a, a gain error. All right. And Again, in many systems, a small gain error is usually not a problem, okay, because there are in a system you will have some adjustment possible to calibrate out you know, all these small gain errors. And please note that if you kind of discount the staircase shape, this uh, I mean, if you fit a straight line. I mean a straight line is within quotes a linear system, right. Okay. So, in most analog systems a gain error, a small gain error is benign and so is a small offset. 
okay that does not mean that now you add rules of offset and the system will work right or you know if I multiply if I make all the steps sizes infinite then right then the slope will become 0 right that does not mean it is ok you understand. So, a small gain error is tolerable and similarly a, a small offset is usually ok. There are applications where it is not ok in which case we have to worry about it, but most of the time you are ok. Hmm? Now, the next kind of error what do you think what other errors do you think I mean the most uh, uh, general thing of course, would be that the step sizes are not the same throughout right. I mean in fact, if the, the step sizes were all the same you know I would be very very surprised when you try to build a system and the step sizes were all you know magically the same there must be something really uh, nice going on inside ok. So, but if you kind of realize a system like this more often than not you would not be surprised at all if all the step sizes were non uniform ok. And, uh, uh, so, in a real quantizer you will find that all these errors occur together it is not as if you will have only offset error or only gain error or only variable step sizes right you will have you will have an offset you will can potentially have a gain error along with a non uniform step size. So, let us draw a picture and see a case where the step sizes are ok. So, another piece of jargon the step size is often also referred to as the least significant bit or the LSB right. I mean the idea being that the step size is the change in the input voltage required to cause the code to flip by 1 LSB right ok. So, uh, in other words it is you know the size of one of the ranges that you are trying to classify the input into ok. So, often you will hear in uh, data converter li uh, literature or you say the LSB is 1 millivolt or the LSB is half a millivolt. What that means is that you are dividing up the input analog range into many steps ideally all equal steps and the size of each step is 1 millivolt or half millivolt as the case may be. Now, clearly in this picture the gray shows the ideal staircase that we were expecting. Unfortunately, the step sizes are not uniform and we are getting different codes having different widths ok. For example, the code 1 has a width which is is it greater than the nominal width or smaller than the, no, the, than the nominal width? I have drawn the ideal staircase in grey code 1, code 1 ok. So, the width corresponding to the input range corresponding to code 1 is this right and ideally what was it supposed to be? It was supposed to only extend from here to here and as you can see this code is is wider than what it was ideally supposed to be correct ok. Similarly, code 2 I would say from this picture is also wider than what it is supposed to be. What about code 3 and code 4? 
code 3 is definitely smaller and code 4 is very definitely smaller than the ideal step size. Code 5 is much wider. What about code 6? Code 6 does not occur at all, right. So, code 6 is what you call a a missing code. understand. So, when you want to specify a quantizer, what information would you need to give somebody uh, a complete idea of how the characteristic of this quantizer looks like? There are many ways in which you can give this information, right. Please note that all this information is simply telling you at what analog input voltage does this code transition occur, right. So, if I give you a list of all analog input voltages at which code transitions occur, right, I have in principle given you all that you need to know about this quantizer, you understand, okay. Another equivalent way of doing this is to give you the width of the width of each code, correct, you understand. So, so characteristic can be specified by A all code transitions b all code widths and when i mean code widths what are the, what do i mean by code widths right it is the analog input range over which that code is is coming out of is asserted by the quantizer okay and it is simply related to the transition voltages the width of code for example code i let's call this if i call this code i right let me call this V i, okay. or let me not use i because they get confused with the input. Let us call this code k and let us call this this transition voltage, which is the voltage at which this code first appears. Let me call that V k, then the code width is nothing but V k plus 1 minus V k. The set of all v the set of all v k s completely specifies the the characteristic, right? Which means that the if I give you v k plus one minus v k for all codes, that also equivalently specifies the characteristic. You understand? Okay. All right. Now, ideally, the step size is supposed to be. Ideally, the step size is supposed to be constant and equal to in this particular case V ref by 8 in general equal to 1 LSB by definition, correct. So, it does not make sense to specify code width as 0.8 LSB, 1.1 LSB, 1.01 LSB and so on. We know that they are all nominally supposed to be 1 LSB, it is enough to specify the deviation from the from the nominal step size, you understand. So, in other words, giving information in the form of V k plus 1 minus V k, which is the width of code k, minus 
1 L S B. What are the units of 1 L S B? It will be if we are talking about a quantizer which quantizes uh, voltage, then 1 L S B will obviously be uh, yeah, have a dimension of volts. So, V k plus 1 minus V k is the width of the kth code, this minus 1 L S B is the deviation of the width of code k from the id right and this is got a name i will come up i will tell you why this is called uh, given the name uh, it is this is called the differential nonlinearity at code k so, d n l of k is this and as we have written it the d n l the differential nonlinearity has dimensions of volts and uh, in order to compare different converters it may not it may turn out that they are even though they have the same number of bins in other words they have the same you divide up the input range into the same number of partitions. Okay. The absolute value of the input range may differ from converter to converter. So, it does not make sense to talk about the absolute DNL of a code, right? It makes sense to talk about a relative to what? Relative to the nominal LSB of the converter. In other words, in normal, you do not talk about it in terms of millivolts, you talk about it in terms of number of LSBs of that converter, correct. So, in other words, the differential nonlinearity corresponding to a code K is often normalized to the LSB. So, V K plus 1 minus V K minus 1 LSB divided by 1 LSB whatever that happens to be. Okay. Now, the question is why is it called differential nonlinearity? Why does nonlinearity itself make sense? Why do you think it makes sense to call it nonlinearity? Pardon? Well, it is nonlinear to begin with any way, even if the step size is the same, the curve is nonlinear, isn't it? It is different, yes. Like this, this itself is not constant. Yeah, okay. So, you can I mean so basically if the code widths keep changing, it kind of means that the slope of the of the curve is different at different inputs. Okay. So, it definitely that is something which is nonlinear. Okay. And differential nonlinearity gives you information about the local slope. Correct? You understand? So, uh, so uh, I mean DNL uh, or differential nonlinearity is giving you information about how the converter performance, how uniform the step size is in a, in a I mean over a narrow range. You understand? Okay. So this is one way of specifying the characteristic of the quantizer. The DNL consists, I mean if I give you the DNL as a function of all the codes, if I give you all the code, uh, I mean the DNLs for all the codes, then in principle the entire characteristic is specified, no more information is necessary. You understand? So, but uh, often it is also convenient to have not only show differential nonlinearity, it is also uh, interesting to see not just locally how the steps vary, but I would also like to see how far away my actual code transition is from the ideal code transition. You understand that 
Yes. So the DNA is going to be the expression. We get the one less B. Sorry. But one less B for the ideal test is for. Oh. Okay, I am going to confuse the VK plus one and minus VK. That is also one less B. No, 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 no. VK plus one minus VK are the actual. Let me say this is code K, this is this is code K plus 1, correct? V K represents the, the, the lowest voltage that will result in a code K. So, by the same token, V K plus 1 will represent the lowest voltage that will result in a code K plus 1. Please note that if the quantizer was ideal, Right? Then they should have been. They should have been these values. V k and V k plus one should coincide with those two blue lines, right? But due to some non-idealities in the implementation, the V k and the V k plus one are not. They should be, you know, are not what they should be ideally. That different, correct? And we are quantifying that difference. Because V k and V k plus 1 are not what they should be, the width of the code k is not what it should have been, which is ideally 1 L s b, right. Correct, right. I mean, are you able to see uh, the, the gray, the gray uh, characteristic that is the ideal characteristic, whereas the black one is the, the actual one. Okay. So, V k plus 1 minus V k is ideally supposed to be 1 L s b. So, for an ideal converter, the d n L is or the differential nonlinearity is 0. For the actual one, of course, it can either be positive or negative. You understand? Uh, for example, code 4 here. Do you think the DNL is positive or negative? The step size is smaller than the ideal step size. So, this is negative DNL. What about uh, code 5? Positive DNL. What about code 6? So, for a missing code, the DNL is minus 1. Okay. You understand? And please note that the DNL as a function of code is telling you the width of that code k. So, it is you know in some sense giving you the local slope of the staircase. You understand? Okay. All right. So, in the next class we will we will continue with this and and uh, uh, another measure of another way of specifying the same information which is called integral nonlinearity uh, we will continue with that in the next class. Mm -hmm.